for uh, today's lecture is to quickly finish the uh, screening discussion from last time, and then uh, we'll move on to uh, bosonic uh, uh, systems in, in condensed matter. So uh, regarding screening, um, we um, uh, derive this uh, linear uh, dielectric function and uh, just to remind you, basically, we just did straight perturbation theory in uh, this uh, induced charge density uh, and assumed that that was small. And just on that basis, to leading order in uh, the, the, the perturbation potential, we got uh, uh, this simple expression for the dielectric function. And we now analyze it in a few uh, simple cases to see what uh, it implies. So, um, first of all, let me make the following observation at low temperature and uh, for small q, the numerator is zero. unless uh, a K is very close to the Fermi level, okay? And how, how do we see this? Um, well, we see that from the following uh, uh, sketch. I can uh, uh, sketch the Fermi sphere for you, right? So this is Kx and Ky. This is Kf. And uh, notice what the numerator looks like. So it's a Fermi function of a k plus half a q, k minus half a q, and q is small, meaning the two points at which I'm evaluating this Fermi function are nearby, right? And for this to be non-zero, uh, the two values have to be different, right? When they are both, for instance, one, as it would be if both of those momenta were inside the Fermi sphere, then this is zero. When they are both zero as it would be if both momenta were outside the Fermi sphere, then again, the difference would be zero. The only way the difference is non-zero at low temperature is when, say, k plus q is, uh, k plus half a q is inside the Fermi sphere and k minus half a q is outside the Fermi sphere, which means that this k has to be close to the Fermi level. And then the difference here Q just uh, spans uh, the, the Fermi surface. And in that case, the difference here will be two, right? Because one of them is uh, a zero. Sorry, the difference will be one because one of them is zero and the other one is one. Um, and under these conditions, when uh, K is close <coughs> to the uh, Fermi level and Q is small, one can expand this in the small uh, Q. And what one can write then k plus minus half a q, so we can expand in q. And uh, the expansion looks like this. The leading term is just f of k. That's the term when q is equal to 0. And then the linear term in q uh, has this form. And uh, there are high order terms uh, in Q that we neglect in this expansion, right? So, so this term is uh, linear in Q, and uh, there should be a derivative with respect to K here, but I transform that into <coughs> derivative of mu, and you can check that. Uh, that is, in fact, correct. So now, once I have this, uh, I can just substitute these two guys up here in the numerator, and notice that this prefactor here, k dot q over m, is exactly what I have in the denominator, so it will cancel out. Okay? And the expression in that case will simplify, so I have a chi of q approximately equal to, for small q, to minus e squared over volume, sum over k 
d f k over d mu. Okay, and I want you to uh, look at this for a moment and tell me if this reminds you of something, maybe. Um, so have we seen a result like this? It looks like the Thomas Fermi result. Exactly. So this is nothing but the Thomas Fermi result that uh, we derived yesterday. <coughs> and this is good because, remember, Thomas Fermi approximation was uh, based on the assumption that this potential varies slowly in space. And this is exactly uh, what we should get when uh, we're expanding this. So, so this does not have that restriction, but when we focus on small q, that means that uh, our potential is varying slowly in space. So it's no surprise that we recover uh, Thomas Fermi. Okay? So uh, this is good. The, the linear dielectric function in the limit of long wavelengths is consistent with Thomas Fermi. That's uh, uh, what we expect. Um, now, can we learn something new from this uh, that is not uh, contained in Thomas Fermi? And indeed we can, so that's the second observation. It turns out that at t equals zero, um, these guys become just uh, step functions, right? The Fermi function at t equals zero, just a step function. And in that case, one can perform this uh, uh, summation exactly by, as usual, going into a thermodynamic limit, writing it as an integral. And it's an exercise that I will not do here. I will just give you the result. So at t equals zero, the k sum can be performed. And uh, the result then looks like this. And when you see the result, again, it will remind you of something. So if you look at this form here, uh, it's exactly the same form as this function capital F that we obtained in Hartree-Fock approximation. And indeed, if you look at this integral, and if you write it down for t equals 0, you would find that it's exactly the same integral that we already did. So that's another reason why I'm not uh, uh, doing it here again. Um, so. In, in, in fact, what this means that in this linear approximation, one can obtain exact result in uh, the limit when the temperature is zero. <coughs> For non-zero temperatures, one cannot do this integral exactly, but uh, at least in, in the ground state, uh, this is the result. Now, uh, perhaps you, you will recall that uh, one comment that we made about this functional form in the context of uh, uh, the Hartree-Fock approximation, is that it's non-analytic. Uh, this function is non-analytic at uh, x equals 1. Um, so if we call this function f of x, uh, then uh, I told you, or we, we, we discovered that f prime at 1 goes to infinity, or rather minus infinity, um, and that actually <clears throat> has some uh, consequences for uh, the physics uh, of screening. And let me write that down. This is a, a kind of interesting thing that is uh, observable physically. <clears throat> so because the dielectric uh, function is non-analytic, Mm -hmm. 
at uh, q equals to kf, which corresponds to x equals one point in, in uh, uh, that notation, <clears throat> one can show that uh, the screened potential of a point charge has a term at, again, t equals zero, which is when that uh, formula is valid, and uh, at r much larger than uh, inverse Fermi wavelength, that looks like this. So interestingly, there's non-analyticity that uh, occurs in that function. If you were to calculate with this dielectric function uh, a potential that arises from a test charge, point-like test charge that you put in a metal, you would find that there's a term that at long distances has this power law decay and oscillatory behavior. <coughs> right? And this is uh, uh, the so-called Friedel oscillations. And these are observable in experiment. Um, this uh, uh, this uh, oscillation in uh, in the screened potential translate to oscillations also in induced charge, and these can be measured by various techniques. And indeed, uh, it turns out that. When uh, you, you, you have a, a metal and you put some, uh, some, say, positively charged impurity at the origin and you observe the charge density, then indeed it has this oscillatory profile. And uh, the period of oscillation here actually agrees with what is uh, expected to be the uh, Fermi uh, wave vector. So this is, for instance, rho induced of R has this type of behavior. Um, once I manage to set up the projection system, I will show you some images of this, uh, but uh, uh, not today. I didn't uh, really bring my computer. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, uh, cool uh, prediction that uh, the simple model makes, and indeed is, is ubiquitously seen in, in metals. Yes? You have to be Oh well, I'm, I'm I'm just sketching. So so this this of course is valid only at long distances. So something happens here uh, that you, one should not take that seriously. What one should take seriously is the oscillations at large R. There is some shift in those. Uh, typically, there would be a shift. Yeah, 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 yeah. So more generally, one can write this that there there is some phase that uh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but the 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 message that I'm dri driving here is that in addition to the exponential decay that uh, is predicted by Thomas Fermi, uh, Leonard uh, has more uh, physics in it, and in addition, it predicts this type of oscillatory behavior, and um, yeah, it looks like this. Uh, sometimes these oscillations in the literature are also called R K K Y. because they were simultaneously uh, discovered by these four gentlemen, Ruderman, Kittel, Kittel, Kasuya, and Yoshida. Okay, I remember that. So um, depending on uh, whether you're uh, French, uh, then you prefer Kittel, uh, sorry, Friedel. When you're Japanese, you prefer these gentlemen. Anyway, so, so this is uh, uh, basically it about screening. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, can this 
be observed through experiments, I mean, this oscillating behavior. Yes, sure, yeah. And I will show some. The, the, the most spectacular are these scanning tunneling microscopy measurements where they take surfaces of simple metals like copper and they evaporate some impurities on top and they can scan with atomic resolution. And whenever you have a charged impurity, you see this beautiful oscillatory behavior that goes for many oscillations. And if you sometimes you might have seen it is when, when these uh, figures uh, first came out maybe 15 years ago or so. Uh, they were all around the place on Scientific American, had it on the cover and all that. So uh, th this is ubiquitously observed these days. Yeah. Uh, so before I move on to bosons, I'd like to mention uh, one thing, suggested reading. Fermi liquid theory. And a very nice discussion is given in Ashcroft and Merman, pages 345 to 351. So Fermi liquid theory is a kind of theory that ties up all these bits and pieces that we discussed about metals, and it, it's a kind of major accomplishment of the 20th century physics where Landau, for the first time, have been able to show mathematically um, why metals really are well described by non-interacting collection of uh, electrons, more or less. Um, this is by no means obvious. If you look at the energy scale of interaction, in a, in a metal, it's large. It's not negligible compared to uh, kinetic energy. But nevertheless, when you uh, describe metals as non-interacting, usually you do well. And when you start including interactions naively, such as through Hartree-Fock, you find all these contradictions. And then you have to <laughs> consider screening and other arguments. And basically, uh, Landau, uh, this was known for many years, and Landau in the 50s, uh, showed why this is the case, and, and you know the screening and, and uh, so on is part of that. Um, I don't really have time to go through Fermi liquid theory. That would take many lectures to discuss it properly. But if you're interested, Ashcroft and Mermin in about six pages gives you a kind of uh, synopsis and, and, a, and a very nice overview of it. Yes? Could you recommend a good text for this in terms of like the um, second foundation? OK. So there is an excellent review article by Shankar that uh, does this properly, right? But it's a 70-page review article which uses some really heavy-duty math like RG and uh, Green's functions and, and all that. And we teach it at UBC in a kind of second condensed matter class. And it takes about a third of a semester to go <coughs> through this. So it's one reason why I'm not going through it. Now, the way Landau did it, uh, it's kind of interesting. He, of course, didn't know at that time RG and, and, and this, these, these techniques. Uh, but he substituted for all these techniques his enormous intuition. And when you try to do it uh, the way Landau did it, then it all looks like, OK, so how did he come up with this? And why is this true? But uh, you know, he, he got it right, uh, although doing it his way is also not extremely easy, I would say. It's, it's, uh, it's a kind of, uh, you have to take lots on faith, and then you have to check that all your assumptions work, and so on. So uh, it's a kind of culmination of this classic uh, condensed matter physics, but we don't have time really uh, to go uh, into it in this class. So I read Pardon me? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. It's uh, yeah, I, I I can find it for it's, it's review. Shankar, review modern physics. You type Shankar. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nineties. <coughs> That's probably the the best way. If you just want a kind of uh, overview, then actually these few pages are pretty good. Yeah, uh, the article is very pedagogical because it's. Uh, with the convention of renormalization. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it, you know, it, yeah. So it's, it's, a, 
it's a serious investment of time, though, if you want to do it. It's not like something that you can read on Friday afternoon. Uh, at least not me, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me uh, move on. And uh, <clears throat> let, 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 let's just shift gears. And uh, I move on to bosons, boson systems in condensed matter. So we discussed, well, mostly fermions up to now, electrons, right? Theory of screening and Hartree Fock and all this <clears throat> was electrons, but bosonic systems play a very important role in, in condensed matter. And, and essentially, there's two kinds of bosonic systems that one can discuss. Um, there is uh, systems with real or what one may call fundamental bosons. And uh, these are bosonic particles that, whose number is conserved. So for instance, in this category, we would have uh, helium-4, uh, rubidium gas, uh, sodium gas, uh, and so on. Um, and these form uh, quantum liquids that uh, helium-4 has been known for many years. Uh, these guys uh, have been, uh, have been uh, uh, made quantum back in 1995 when people started studying uh, cold atom gases. And the important thing, once again, is that the number is conserved. Uh, what that means is that helium atom is, is real in a sense that it cannot appear and disappear at will. So their number, if you put bunch of helium atoms in a container, they, they, that number is constant and cannot change. On the other hand, you have these emergent bosons. Which are no less real than, than these fundamental bosons, but uh, these emerge as uh, uh, excitations of, uh, of a solid. And the best known examples are phonons and magnons. Um, phonons, as you probably know, are quanta of lattice vibrations. Magnons, similarly, are quanta of magnetic fluctuations in uh, solids. And for these, uh, numbers are not conserved. Also, they, they have no separate existence outside the solid. Whereas if you have a bucket full of helium-4, you can take out the individual atom and examine it, and that's fine. When you have a solid, you have a bunch of phonons inside, but you, there, there's no, no notion by which you can take out an individual phonon and look at it because it's an excitation of the collective system uh, of the lattice vibrations. And similarly for magnons and other emergent particles, um, there, there's a fundamental difference between the two the first class undergoes what is known Bose-Einstein condensation, whereas the second one does not. So here we have BEC, and here there is other interesting effects. So we need to discuss them separately, although much of the physics is, uh, is shared. Um, so let me start with uh, this first class, fundamental bosons. I will first review the <coughs> basics of Bose-Einstein condensation, which you have probably seen in your statistical mechanics class. And then I will lay out what is known as Bogolyubov theory of liquid helium, which uh, shows why, for instance, this uh, uh, at low temperatures, uh, helium-4 becomes a superfluid, and some other things. OK, so Bose-Einstein condensation. And this is just a brief review. If you've never seen this, then I can suggest some basic uh, statistical mechanics texts. Um, so one starts from Bose-Einstein distribution. Uh, 
which has the following form, n of k is 1 over e to beta epsilon k minus mu minus 1. And this gives you a probability that in a thermal equilibrium, a boson with energy epsilon of k will be in a state uh, with uh, that energy. Okay? And mu is chemical potential as before. This is uh, similar to Fermi-Dirac distribution, except that there is this minus one as opposed to plus one, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, difference due to the different uh, uh, statistics of the particles. These are bosons, so they satisfy different commutation rules than uh, uh, fermions. So the total number from here can be written as uh, simply sum over, and now we switch to p for some reason here, uh, but that's fine, np, and uh, <coughs> this is just sum over 1 over e to beta epsilon p minus mu plus 1. Okay. Now, one important point that I would like to stress right away is that uh, we need, in this description, all these uh, NPs to be, ah, uh, yeah, I'm so used to fermions that uh, it's just automatic, sorry about that. So all these NPs has to be greater or equal to one because they give you occupation numbers, right? They cannot be negative. And this immediately implies that mu has to be less than zero or equal, right? If mu were, well, okay, so, so mu is less or equal to zero for the usual kinetic energy that I will immediately write, which is just h bar squared p squared over 2m, okay? Ah, yeah, uh, again. Greater than or equal to zero. Yes, I have to focus better. Um, so uh, anyway, yeah, so the occupation numbers have to be greater than uh, zero because negative occupation number does not make any sense. And uh, um, because this energy is greater or equal than zero, the smallest value is zero, you can check that these guys, if you put zero here, and if you were to take non-negative mu, this would lead to something. Well, basically, this exponential would be smaller than 1, and the whole uh, occupation number would go negative. So these are some basic things about bosons that uh, we have to remember. OK, so with this preparation, one can take this equation and write the following inequality. Uh, one can write that uh, the total number is less or uh, equal to sum over p of the same expression, but taken mu to 0. And this is simply because, uh, as you can check, epsilon to beta epsilon p minus mu is always greater or equal than epsilon to beta epsilon p, okay? Um, and that's, a, that's an obvious inequality. You can cancel out e to beta epsilon p, and you simply get that this guy is greater <laughs> than 1, which is true for this uh, uh, condition. So in this sum, if I take uh, every mu, if, if I take mu 0, every term will be made larger than it actually is, and therefore, this inequality uh, holds. So now, uh, notice also that uh, when p is equal to 0, then uh, this denominator diverges, and therefore, zero momentum term is really uh, not defined in this sum. And for this reason, let me rewrite this as uh, n of 0. So this is all the particles that are in zero momentum state. And then I sum over p with a prime here of the same thing. 
e to beta epsilon p minus 1. Okay? Um, so this is sum over all p that is not equal to 0. And for those, this is actually well defined. And now, all I will do, I will rewrite this sum again in thermodynamic limit as an integral. And uh, I rewrite this inequality as follows. This is n naught plus omega over 2 pi cubed. And I will explain what omega is in a moment. Integral <coughs> from 0 plus to infinity d3k divided by epsilon beta h bar k squared over 2m minus 1. Okay, Omega here is the volume. And I'm following this convention because this is what's usually done in the literature on liquid helium because V is taken by some other uh, thing, which will be the interaction. OK. So uh, now look at this inequality. And it turns out that this integral here <coughs> on the right-hand side uh, can be calculated by uh, going to spherical uh, coordinates and, uh, and uh, by, so, so I do d3k goes to 4 pi k squared dk. That's the a spherical volume element in, uh, in uh, three dimensions. 4 pi is just the total angular integration. And then I can perform a substitution <coughs> x is uh, this uh, expression in uh, the exponential beta h bar k squared over 2m. And uh, what, what will happen is that uh, this will become a dimensionless integral. I can pull out all the dimensionful factors, and uh, this inequality will become uh, something like this, n naught plus omega beta h bar squared over 2m to minus 3 halves times some constant c. And that constant c is basically just this integral. When I perform a substitution, it's independent of temperature. And that's the important part. Uh, and it just doesn't depend on anything. It's just a number. Okay? Does everybody see that? I don't want to do in a great detail. So again, if I make this substitution, this becomes just e to x minus 1. And then I make the same substitution here. But here I can pull out all the factors except for x. So I will end up with an integral that is just a number, right? And all the dimensionful factors are here. OK, so the important thing to look at is that this part here goes as temperature to power 3 halves, because this beta is an inverse temperature. And so I can now uh, plot the situation for you here. Again, I raise this a little bit so that you can see better. So what I'm plotting here as a function of temperature, here is 0. Uh, I'm plotting this function, right? So this is uh, uh, this. Uh, function t to 3 halves. So I, I will call this whole thing n prime <coughs> of t. Okay. So the, the way you can view this, this represents the number of uh, bosons in the ground state of the system, in the zero momentum state. This then represents all the other uh, bosons. right? And this is the total number of bosons. So what I'm plotting here, this curve, is uh, just this n prime of t. These are all the bosons that are not in the ground state. 
And uh, <clears throat> if I have some fixed number of bosons n, that doesn't change with temperature. Those are just my helium <laughs> atoms or rubidium atoms that I put in at the beginning. And notice what's happening. So this n prime dot t at some point here, necessarily, since it goes to zero, necessarily dips below the total number of particles, right? Which tells me that to satisfy this inequality, I have to put a macroscopic number n naught of my bosons into the ground state. Okay? And the lower temperature I go, the larger this number is. And eventually, at t equals 0, all of them will be in the ground state to satisfy this inequality. And that's the phenomenon of, of Bose-Einstein condensation. Done kind of very, in a very quickly and dirty way. Um, if you do this more properly, you don't do this uh, trick with the inequality. You try to solve the equations exactly. But uh, I, again, I, I'm relying on the fact that you've seen this before. So BEC equates to macroscopic number of bosons in uh, the p equals 0 state. Okay? And these bosons have some interesting properties. They form a condensate, uh, and we will discuss that uh, now. Now, notice that this is not possible for fermions because fermions, their statistics prohibits more than one fermion in a given state. Yes? Can I even ask about the last argument here? It seems like if, if there's Any questions? Yes? So if you put Einstein condensation into the gravity process, does it happen accidentally? Um, it's, it's a phase transition that, uh, well, in this simple treatment, it happens at that point that I marked, right? Above it, there is no need for, to put macroscopic number of bosons in the zero momentum state. Below it, there is. Uh, in a more refined treatment, you would find uh, uh, a kind of better expression for that transition. But, but there is a true phase transition. You cool it down, nothing remarkable happens, and suddenly there is a phase transition, and, and you see uh, the macroscopic uh, occupation. Any other questions? OK, so let me move on to uh, now a more detailed discussion of this. And this goes under the name of Bogolyubov theory. Of helium-4. And, and, and so one thing remarkable about this phase transition is that it occurs in the absence of any interactions, just because of the Bose-Einstein statistics. Now, of course, this is not uh, really uh, what happens in, in a real system like helium, those Helium atoms actually interact uh, among themselves, and this is what Bogolyubov addressed back uh, in the 50s. So uh, this is actually 1946, so even uh, before 60s. So this is a theory of weakly interacting bosons. And, and I'm talking about these fundamental number-conserving bosons. Um, the Hamiltonian that Bogolyubov used is the one that we already wrote down before in second quantization, epsilon k, a dagger k, a k, plus, so this is a kinetic energy, which we take to be just a, um, a ordinary parabolic dispersion, k, k prime q, Vq, a dagger, k minus q, a dagger, k prime plus q, a k prime, a k. So the interaction term is just like we derived it in our discussion of uh, 
of uh, second quantization. Um, these are bosonic operators. There is no spin. And VQ here is not Coulomb interaction because helium atoms are neutral, but it's some short-range interaction that these atoms feel when their uh, wave function clouds start overlapping. And uh, we will just uh, uh, keep it general at this point. So uh, let me just remind you that AK, AK prime dagger is delta KK prime. And all the other commutators vanish. AK, AK prime. It's A dagger K. A dagger K prime is zero. VQ is a Fourier transform of uh, short range interatomic interaction. And uh, epsilon k is just h bar squared k squared over 2m, where m um, I will, OK, let me see what I use here. where m is uh, just the mass of uh, the helium atom. And uh, we will assume from now on weak interaction and low temperature such that um, most of the bosons are in this condensate. Okay, Just a few are excited and will be interested in understanding how these interactions modify the, the ground state in which uh, everybody is condensed. <coughs> so uh, under these conditions, we expect ground state, or the appropriate thermal state, in some sense that is close to the Bose-Einstein condensate which in second quantized notation looks like this. So this is a ground state of n bosons. And uh, if there were no interaction, this would just be a naught dagger to power n acting on uh, the vacuum. right? So this just puts all my uh, bosonic particles in the lowest energy state. That would be the expression for Bose-Einstein condensate at uh, t equals 0 if there were no interactions. Now, once again, uh, this Hamiltonian that we have here is not exactly soluble because of these interactions here. And uh, uh, Bogolyubov uh, made the following approximations. Yes. No, it's, it's an unnormalized. Well, uh, no, no, th this, this is normalized. Yeah, this, this just uh, gives you uh, a state. Yeah, yeah, th th this should be normalized, I think. I, I, I think this is normalized. Uh, but yeah, I can, I can double check this. Yeah, the, the, those factors, when we define these operators, they were defined, the, the, those factors, square root of n and so on, were chosen precisely so that these types of states remain normalized, I, I think. Yeah, although there may be different conventions in the literature. And if it's not normalized, then we just normalize it. That's not a, an issue here. Uh, OK. So um, basically, what Bogolyubov uh, did is the following. He assumed that most, even with interactions, 
most of these bosons will still be in the ground state. And uh, therefore, um, a dagger naught, a naught, can be replaced by the expectation value, which is just n naught. Okay? And similarly, he said, okay, this, and, and this is a key point, a dagger not a dagger not also can be approximated by n naught. So, so this, this is easy to see, right? If you have a state like this and you hit it with, uh, uh, this, um, with this number operator, uh, then you just get, uh, you just get uh, uh, this number, right? Because th that many particles you have in the ground state. However, this is somewhat less easy to see. And uh, let's just uh, check this. So uh, let me hit this wave function phi naught n with the product of two of those operators. And let me now use the rules that uh, uh, we derived uh, in class before. So I will get n naught plus 1 times n naught plus 2, okay, acting on phi n plus 2 state 0. But since n is uh, uh, macroscopically large, I can forget about these 1 and 2 and say that this is roughly n naught with, with a very good accuracy. Okay? So this is the, the Bogolyubov approximation. Basically, he said that since there is macroscopic occupancy of a single state, we can simply, uh, instead of treating this as operators, we can replace them by C numbers and then only worry about what happens in all the other states that uh, are not at zero energy. Yes? Ah, so that's the, that's the key point. So the ground state, once you include interactions, the ground state will not have a well-defined number of particles. And that's a key thing that one needs to wrap uh, one's brain around. And that's both uh, uh, true in, in superfluids as well as in superconductors. And I will comment on that because that's a, a non-trivial, uh, non um, very non-trivial issue. Okay, so this is how we proceed. Uh, we don't need to do anything with uh, uh, the first term here. Uh, of course, there is a part where k is equal to zero here, but this energy also is zero there, so that term just doesn't really do anything. But in this interaction term, what we do, uh, again, following Bogolyubov, we separate each of these summations into two pieces, one which only has k equals zero, and one where we have everything else, right? And whenever we see terms like this or like that, we immediately replace them by this n naught. Now, it's a bit uh, uh, laborious thing to do because we have three different sums here, and each has to be replaced by a piece that has k equals zero and everything else. So that's a two times two times two. Uh, that's eight different terms that one has to analyze. So I will not do this uh, in detail on the blackboard. I will just um, I will just outline how this is done. So uh, we do this. We separate k into a sum where k is equal to zero plus sum over k with the prime, and we do the same thing with uh, k prime and uh, with the Q summation, okay, um, that will result in eight different terms. And we will then replace A dagger zero, A zero, and A dagger zero, A dagger zero, and A zero, A zero, all by N naught in those terms, right? And finally, we will keep only terms with 
at least one power of n naught. Okay? And this is on the account that n naught we expect to be macroscopically large. Let me maybe continue here. So this is what one obtains uh, after uh, this operation. And again, if you, maybe you see it right away. If you don't, I encourage you to go over those, all those eight terms. Uh, there is nothing really very profound about that algebra. But uh, uh, one probably needs to do it once in their life. Okay, so this is what one gets. And let me just write that there are um, also terms that have no powers of n naught, and we ne neglect them. So let me write it as O uh, terms O1. So these uh, uh, do not have any n, so they would be much smaller than uh, the guys that we kept. So uh, l l let me just uh, comment on a few terms here. For instance, how you get uh, this first term. Well, this first term arises from the term, obviously, where k is equal to k prime, and this is equal to q, and they are all equal to 0. Right? If you do that here in this Hamiltonian, then you get uh, vq of 0, and then everything else is 0, so you basically get n squared uh, from each of those terms. Okay? Similarly, uh, this term you would get when uh, k prime is equal to q is 0, uh, but uh, uh, the k is non-zero, right? And again, you can see that that's what you get, and so on. E each term, you can see that it results from uh, um, uh, this type of uh, decoupling. Um, also note that what we obtain in this last term are these weird terms that contain uh, AA and A dagger, A dagger. And these are often called Bogolyubov or anomalous terms. Because they don't conserve uh, the the number of bosons, right? Uh, when you hit the state with n bosons with this, you get a state with n plus 2 bosons. Uh, when you do it with this one, you get a state with n minus 2 bosons. So they don't conserve the number of bosons. And uh, of course, the original Hamiltonian <laughs> did not have that property. The original Hamiltonian perfectly conserves uh, uh, the number of bosons. And what has happened is that in this approximation, where we replace the, uh, these products of A0, A0 operators by N0, we're, we're kind of breaking uh, this symmetry that conserves uh, uh, the number of bosons. And you can think of these processes as being processes such that you have two particles, say, uh, at momentum Q and momentum minus Q, and then they disappear into this condensate. Right? So, so basically, this is a process where two particles with opposite momenta meet, and uh, they kind of uh, uh, form two particles that now have zero 
momentum, right? And then once they have zero momentum, they can disappear into the condensate because they have zero energy, so they rejoin the macroscopic number of uh, particles that are already in the condensate. So that's uh, uh, a feature of these uh, uh, types of theories, like Bogolyubov theory, that they don't conserve uh, the number of particles, but it's not like these particles, these helium atoms are disappearing, really. They're not disappearing, they are uh, disappearing into the condensate, or uh, this term would uh, uh, describe a process in which two particles just emerge out of the condensate. Any questions about this? Yes? Uh, BCS is 1956, so it's about 10 years. This was first. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there was, of course, another uh, another step, logical step in BCS that those are fermions, right? Electrons. And uh, Cooper had to invent his Cooper pair, which is, uh, in a way, boson. So uh, that, that there was another uh, layer of difficulty in, in superconductivity, but yeah, we'll discuss that later. OK, so now our goal is uh, to analyze this Hamiltonian uh, to see what happens. And uh, uh, to this end, let me define a few things just to clean up our notation. I define this quantity eta of k as being n naught times v of k, and I define h bar capital omega k as being epsilon k plus eta k. And again, this just follows the traditional description uh, of uh, Bogolyubov theory that you find in the literature. And uh, also, it turns out one can combine uh, these two terms, um, basically uh, notice that <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> this describes all the particles in the condensate, whereas this is a number operator for all the particles that are out of condensate. Because of this uh, a prime, there's a summation over all states except 0. So together, when you act with this on the wave function, you should get something on the order of n. And uh, uh, this allows us to actually combine uh, nicely these two terms. And let me show you how this works. So 1 half uh, n naught squared v naught plus n naught v naught sum over k prime a dagger k a k. This is uh, what I call n prime. And I will assume in uh, uh, keeping with our uh, general philosophy that this n prime is much smaller than both n and n naught. So this is the assumption that we're very close to uh, B, C ground state. And in that case, um, 1 half n squared V naught can be expanded as follows, 1 half V naught n naught squared plus twice n naught n prime, but this is sum over k prime a dagger k a k plus so on. So basically, the bottom line is that I can replace uh, these two terms um, by something like this. Where should I continue?
so <coughs> using this expression, I have replaced the sum of these two terms by this. So that's my first term. And then using my definition of uh, omega k and eta k, I have just reorganized all the terms so that my Hamiltonian has this uh, more compact form. And this is all, often something called Bogolyubov Hamiltonian. <coughs> yeah, this is Greek letter eta. Uh, yes, sorry. There should also be dagger. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're going to solve this Bogolyubov Hamiltonian. And, and if you ask how, then the answer is we solve it by Bogolyubov transformation. So he wrote down this Hamiltonian, and he scratched his head for a while, and then he invented um, a Bogolyubov transformation. So Bogolyubov transformation is defined as follows. It's basically a rotation in uh, this bosonic space. So I go from a dagger k, a k, to alpha k, alpha dagger k, which are also bosonic operators. And I can also invert this transformation. So this is the inverse Bogolyubov transformation. And u k and v k are just some unknown coefficients that uh, we will need to determine. Um, well, uh, yeah, this is the form of the Bogolyubov transformation. Uh, I, yeah, I think in the literature sometimes you find, uh, you may find minus, but then the relations for these u's and v's are different. Yeah, but the important part is uh, the relation that these u and v have to satisfy for uh, this to remain a canonical transformation. So let's, uh, let's look at that. So we know what the commutation relations for these A's are. They are just listed somewhere up there, over there. Uh, and uh, we need these alphas to also satisfy bosonic uh, commutation relations. So let's work this out. Alpha k, alpha dagger k prime. And uh, again, this is something that hopefully everybody in the audience can do. I just plug in uh, this on for here, this for there, and I use these commutation relations to uh, work this out. And what I obtain is, uh, <clears throat> after about uh, two lines of, of work, I get delta kk prime times uk squared minus vk squared. And in order for this to be uh, proper bosons, I need to insist that uh, uh, this is equal to 1. So this implies a condition <coughs> that uk squared minus vk squared is equal to 1. Now, we will see that a similar transformation also works for fermions. Uh, 
in superconductivity, and there, there will be a plus sign between the two. And technically, the differences between symplectic and unitary transformation, this is symplectic, <coughs> the other one is unitary. But maybe for these purposes, uh, this is not uh, uh, super important. Um, in this context, alpha dagger k, alpha k, are called uh, quasi-particle operators. They represent creation and annihilation operators of what is called quasi-particles, and these are going to be excitations of, uh, uh, of the ground state uh, of uh, the system. And, and in condensed matter physics, quasi-particles are everywhere. So this is maybe the first quasi-particle that, uh, uh, that we encounter in this context. So what we want now, we want to determine these coefficients u and v that satisfy this condition such that after the transformation, our Bogolyubov Hamiltonian is diagonal, right? Namely, H is written in these uh, new uh, coordinates is H bar omega K alpha K dagger alpha K plus some uh, ground state energy that uh, will just be a constant. Okay, so we want to find U and V that uh, uh, give us this. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, well, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, basically, we write this alpha dagger k, alpha k, in terms of a's through this inverse Bogolyubov transformation, and then see if we can find a match such that uh, these u and v's give us back that Hamiltonian, right? If we can find that match, <laughs> then uh, uh, we're good, and indeed it is possible. Otherwise, I wouldn't be really uh, presenting this. So again, let's just work this out. A k dag alpha k dagger alpha k. I take this times that and multiply it out, and I get an expression like this. I get two terms, u k squared a dagger k a k plus d k squared a minus k a dagger minus k, and I get a second line where I have the mixed terms uk vk times a minus k a k plus a dagger <coughs> k a dagger minus k. Okay? So this looks promising because we see that uh, indeed at least the structure is good, right? Um, over there, I have terms like this, and I have terms like that. So I should be able to match these coefficients or to find these coefficients u and v such that the Hamiltonian is the same. Uh, I need to, uh, uh, so, so the second term looks good. The first term uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, looks uh, not uh, quite right because over there, I just have this first term, not the second one. Uh, so what I do, I will make the following assumption, which I will check later on, that is uh, correct. So I will assume that omega minus k <coughs> is uh, omega k, and also that v minus k squared is vk squared, and I will check this. Right, so, so, so far, this omega k, u k, and v k are unknown coefficients. I can assume that they satisfy that. And if the final solution actually uh, uh, is like that, then I'll be fine. And you can see why I'm assuming that. Basically, when I put this here in the sum, in the second term, I want to change my dummy variable k to minus k. And then I will get v minus k, omega minus k in that term. So I want to declare them to be equal to uh, to be symmetric like that so that I can uh, do everything correctly. So uh, with that, 
uh, let me just look at, again, uh, this thing here, h bar omega k, alpha dagger k, alpha k. Uh, when I uh, do this operation, then I end up with the following, sum over k, h bar omega k, uk squared plus vk squared, a dagger k, a k, plus a term that is just h bar omega k, vk squared. This is just that constant, which I can dump into this, so I don't care about that so much. And then I get the final term, which I just copy here, h bar omega k, uk, vk, a k, a minus k plus a dagger k, a minus k with a dagger. Okay, so now when I compare this with my Hamiltonian here, I see that all the terms are here. And in order for them to actually be equal, I have to equate this coefficient to the first coefficient out there, and one half of this coefficient to the second coefficient uh, over there. Um, so let me do just that and uh, finish this calculation. Um, so uh, basically, I have uh, two conditions when I match this to that Hamiltonian. I have a condition that h bar omega k uk squared plus vk <coughs> squared is equal to h bar capital omega k. So again, this is matching this first term to uh, the first term over there. And then I have to match the second term. And here I get twice h bar omega k uk vk. And this is equal to eta of k. So I have these two equations for two unknowns. But I also have to ensure that they satisfy uh, this condition so that this, uh, this is a legitimate uh, canonical transformation. And the simplest way to do that is actually to square both of these and uh, subtract them. Um, so I square and subtract. And you can see what will happen. I will have an overall term h bar squared omega k squared, which is common to both of these. And then I will have uh, uk squared plus vk squared squared minus 4 times uk squared vk squared. And this is equal to h bar squared omega k squared minus eta k squared. But this thing here actually is simply uk squared minus vk squared squared. And this is equal to 1 by our assumption. So from this, finally, I get that h bar omega k is equal to square root of uh, h bar squared omega k squared minus eta k squared. And uh, this is what is often called uh, Bogolyubov spectrum of excitations. One can now use these equations to solve for also uk and vk. I will not do that. You will uh, do that in the next uh, uh, next uh, tutorial. Um, I will uh, uh, just go ahead and discuss some physics now based on uh, this, uh, what we just found. <clears throat> so physical consequences. Um, 
Okay, so let me massage this spectrum a little bit. Let me just recall that uh, um, eta of k is v naught uh, v k and uh, epsilon k is h bar squared k squared over 2m. Uh, then I can write uh, that um, quasi particle spectrum as h bar omega k square root epsilon k epsilon k plus n naught d of k. It's the same expression, yes. Do we have to take a positive square root? Do we have to what? Take a positive square root of negative. Uh, oh, you mean the, there the minus sign? Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what we want is positive energy excitations above the ground state. So we want to take uh, just a positive, uh, um, positive square root. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so, so let, let's just now check various uh, limiting cases in the last uh, 10 or so minutes. So, so one simple case is to take, so, so, so the question now is what, what do we take for, for this interaction, right? We, 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 we did this in complete generality, but now uh, the spectrum of uh, our Hamiltonian depends on uh, what we take for these excitations. So uh, the simplest thing that one can take is contact repulsion Namely, uh, V of R is some U times delta of R. And this uh, maybe is not a bad approximation for atoms, right? Where they interact only when they overlap very closely. Uh, the, the Fourier transform of this VK is just U over omega for all K. Right, Fourier transform of a delta function is just a constant. And uh, in this case, then h bar omega k uh, is uh, basically this. It's epsilon k, epsilon k plus 2 n naught over omega. times v. And uh, if I call this whole thing e naught for, uh, for simplicity, then uh, I can uh, uh, analyze this in two uh, different limits. Namely, this uh, becomes a square root or <coughs> proportional to square root of epsilon k, which is proportional to just absolute value of k when epsilon k is much smaller than e naught, right? When epsilon k is much smaller than this, then I can neglect this epsilon k and just uh, uh, look at this one. So this is going to be proportional to square root of epsilon k, which goes just like a, a linear spectrum. However, this will go as a epsilon k when epsilon k is larger than e naught. So here I get a quadratic dispersion. Okay. Now this is interesting, especially this first piece. Um, so we're getting linear dispersion. So this is uh, uh, like a sound mode rather than a particle mode, right? Whenever you have massive particles, uh, they the dispersion is quadratic, which occurs here at high energies, but at low energies, we get this sound-like dispersion or light-like dispersion. So, so this behaves more like waves than particles. So at low energy, we find linear 
sound like this version. And this will be important for uh, the theory of, uh, of uh, superfluidity. This, in a way, explains this um, um, superfluidity. Uh, yeah, you can say it that way. Yeah. Um, so now let's look at uh, a slightly more realistic case. So typical interaction. Uh, for helium four uh, has finite range, right? Namely, if you were to plot um, vk as a function of k, it has some finite range. So it would not previously, for contact repulsion, we had a constant, right? That was this constant. But uh, if, if the interaction has a finite range, then it will look something like this, where this uh, uh, typical scale is a naught minus 1. And this a naught minus 1 is the range of that interaction, which is roughly the size of the uh, electronic cloud of, uh, of that helium atom. Uh, so, and, and, and then it goes, zero, uh, it goes to 0 slowly. Now, if you were to plug in uh, this type of dispersion into this equation, uh, this is uh, not so easy to do analytically, but you can convince yourself that the dispersion uh, looks like this, h bar omega k uh, as a function of k. It starts again linearly, but then it has this dip, and then it goes up quadratically. So this part goes like k, this part goes like k squared, and uh, if you were to compare it with just a pure quadratic dispersion, it would look um, like this, and this sometimes is called a roton minimum. <coughs> and this has uh, uh, some uh, historical connotations that I don't have to, time to go into. But uh, the point is, this type of spectrum is actually experimentally observed in, uh, in liquid helium. <coughs> or more accurately, experiments, various experiments done on uh, liquid helium are consistent with this type of spectrum. Um, and so this gives us some confidence that this Bogolubov theory actually uh, works well. OK, so I would like to finish this today. And I have one last uh, argument to make. So let me go through that. And I should be done in about five minutes. That we have. So this is the uh, Landau argument for superfluidity in helium four. And it's actually a very appealing argument, very simple, almost classical <laughs> argument. And this is how it goes. So liquid helium is observed to be superfluid. Namely, it flows without dissipation through narrow channels. If you plunk something into it, it doesn't dissipate. So it turns out the best uh, way to address this theoretically is to imagine that you have a vessel filled with helium-4 that is in this uh, uh, state. And then you imagine you have a massive object, a pebble or something, that moves at a velocity v through this uh, medium. And you analyze the way how this uh, energy and momentum of this object can dissipate. Right? And the way it can dissipate is that it radiates out these quasi-particles, h bar, um, well, like this. So these are the quasi-particles k, because these are the only excitations that are available. right? So it moves through a medium. 
its low energy excitations are these uh, quasi particles that we discussed. So the only way that uh, energy can be dissipated is by radiating uh, these, uh, these excitations. Now, let us write uh, equations for conservation of uh, energy and momentum in these processes. Okay? So conservation of energy is simple. So this is a body of mass m. It has velocity v at the beginning. And then after it radiates out one of these quasi-particles, it has a velocity that is modified. And uh, we need to account for the energy of that quasi-particle, right? So this is conservation of energy. And similarly, uh, we can uh, analyze conservation of momentum, like we learned in uh, uh, high school, maybe, although maybe not with uh, liquid helium. So this is conservation <laughs> of momentum. Um, and then I, I will just massage these equations and show you that they cannot be satisfied at low velocities and high masses. So the, the object will not be able to dissipate any energy because it cannot satisfy these conservation laws. So what I do, I will square this equation and express it like this, m I divide by the m and uh, express this uh, uh, v sub k and m star And uh, then I express this. Uh, what, what appears on uh, the other side is uh, just the uh, basically difference between the two energies, right? Which I replace by h bar omega k uh, from energy conservation. And that <coughs> this comes in. This term is just that term after I divide it by two. Okay, so combining these two equations, I get. Now I look at this equation and notice the following. This term here can be written like this. h bar squared k squared over 2 little m, where little m is the mass of uh, the helium atom, m little m divided by capital M. <laughs> and if this is a pebble, I, I'm, I'm throwing in a macroscopic object. Then, then, then this ratio will be something like 10 to minus 24, right? Because that pebble will have 10 to 24 like big atoms in it, whereas one helium atom has this mass that's not very small. So if you think about it, this term, because of this fact, will be utterly negligible compared to these two terms. These two terms are some microscopic scales. This is the energy of one of these quasi particles. This is the uh, momentum of one of these quasi particles. So those are microscopic scales, whereas this one uh, is uh, by microscopic scale times this pressure. I mean, so I can uh, safely neglect this term here. And then I can look at how can I satisfy this equation. And it turns out that at small velocities, I cannot really satisfy that equation. So let me show that graphically as a function of momentum. K, uh, I plot uh, the left hand side, and it's just a straight line as a function of k. And uh, I can imagine that uh, I'm radiating at some angle theta, so this will be h bar t k. 
say um, cosine of that on the two side, whereas the left hand side, uh, sorry, this was the left hand side, the right hand side is just h bar omega k, so that's that dispersion of all the things. So this dispersion will look something like this h bar omega k, and uh, when this velocity v is small enough, then I see that there's no solution. The only solution here is at zero, but that doesn't help me because zero momentum <coughs> particles don't help me dissipate any. I want finite momentum, finite energy. So the bottom line of the Landau argument is that for less than some critical velocity, there can be no dissipation. So, according to this theory, at low velocity, the body can move through a superfluid medium without any dissipation, and indeed, this is observed. Uh, it's also observed that when you try to push the body at a higher velocity, above some critical velocity, which is typically two centimeters per second, then uh, you start dissipating until the velocity drops below this critical velocity, and that's <coughs> when uh, it again starts moving without dissipation. So uh, <laughs> note is that absolutely crucial, and this is my last point. I'm sorry to keep uh, the overtime, but we started a bit late. Um, absolutely crucial for this is the fact that we have this linear part in the spectrum and low energy, right? If the spectrum was quadratic, then there would be always a solution to that equation because quadratic, if you have quadratic dispersion, right? At, at low momenta, then quadratic function is always smaller than the linear function. Right? So, so this this linear piece that um, follows from this uh, theory is absolutely crucial for Okay. Are there any questions? Yes. Is it possible to? Do all of this while conserving your particles. Um, it is possible, and the uh, eminent scientist who insists on this is Tony Leggett, who obtained uh, a Nobel Prize for some other things. So, unfortunately, so, so you can do all this uh, in a number conserving way. Unfortunately, the price you pay for this is that it's very complicated. <coughs> uh, he has a book which you're welcome to look through, and I went through it. Uh, but really, uh, yeah, so, so, so the bottom line is you can formulate this whole thing without violating the number of particles, but you have to do these crazy things that nobody is willing to do. And it looks like the Bogolibov theory as written uh, kind of agrees with that experiment despite its unappealing feature that it doesn't conserve the number of particles. Can you do it well enough that it returns the same like results, like it agrees with Bogolibov theory and everything? Yeah. So to the extent that you can you can solve these uh, Leggett equations, which you only can do in some special cases because they're very complicated, the results agree with this, right? And you cannot really solve them in all the cases that you would like because they are much more complicated. Any other questions? Okay. So thanks again for your attention. Have a nice weekend. Uh, go play in the snow, and I see you all on Monday. <laughs> so.